on the 12th of October a month ago therefore one of the good fathers in our old university the Angelicum in Rome a Dominican therefore was celebrating the funeral of one of the Dominican fathers who had just passed away there and it is fitting to pause on some lights that he shares with regard to this moment the cross-section of a time and eternity which concerns us in this month of November he notices that the cadaver the body is only equivocally a man. That is actually from Aristotle and it's one that the deceased father they were burying, Father Joseph Nicholas Damecourt, would quote. We tend to have people who would gravitate towards the place of the body and also to, as it were, venerate the body, instinctively addressing to the body what is actually addressed to the soul, because we're familiar with having the soul in the body. And that carries on even after death by instinct, and even long after death, because people go to the grave as though there were a presence there. But the presence is not there. It is good to have these tombs and to have respect physically and therefore to take care of the tomb and to take care of the kadama at death. But we have to be clear in our mind the soul is not there. Where is it? Somebody about to die was saying, I'm in the departure lounge. It's interesting that we see it as a flight. And those who have gone before us, those who have had an experience of death and for a while come back through scientific means, we call it NDE, do have a tale of journeying on. There is movement because the soul is leaving physically where it was, the envelope of the body, and it's moving on. But can we talk of physical movement when there is no fusis, no nature, no body? Well, they talk of it, so they must be experiencing something. They are going towards the author of life. We forget that it is on loan that we have time and life and breath. And it is wrong to complain that the Creator took it away at the wrong time. Our attitude should be one of profound gratitude for one breath. The child, when he starts to exist, receives everything with surprise and gratitude. Something wonderful is happening. And then he gets used to it and starts to think he has rights. And he starts to complain very strongly. If only we could remain as the newborn. Thank you for this new experience, this new day. So, these, thing, these things are worth meditating upon. The first concerns the reality of God the Creator, who has made all things from nothing, and who holds all things in being, who is, and who was, and who will be forever. We call this essential existence as opposed to our 
contingent existence, we can not be. He cannot. The one who can never not be. God. All that is, both in the angelic sphere and in the human sphere, is pure gratuitous being, dreamt into being by the great brain that dreamt the universe. We have no rights. God could have remained alone, but he wanted to share the gift of being. Bonum est diffusum sui. Good is diffuse of itself, and by nature, supreme goodness is supremely generous. He's not selfish, and so he shares. In death, we fall into the hands of God our Creator, who is omnipotent, merciful, and good. He who has made us can sustain us in being forever, and can remake us in the mystery of the resurrection. Now here we're going into the whole realm of faith. And it can be broken down into these two elements which follow. Second, the soul is the seat of the human personality and is immaterial and incorruptible. Here, the soul. Immaterial and incorruptible, characterised by the twin faculties of the intellect and will. In death, this core of the person, notice, this core of the person, is invited into a spiritual life of grace and glory, by which the soul is purified progressively and beatified eventually. Now common sense will tell us that at the moment of death, there is grime, there is baggage, there is clutter. And it's obvious that in that state, to crash into the beatific vision would be very, very violent. And therefore, there is this movement and a progressive going towards through purification of this grime. It's presumption to say there's only heaven and hell, and therefore I'm going straight to heaven. All right, tell us when you get there. Third, now this is a second section, therefore, the body. The body is an essential part of our constitution as persons, to say the least. But our bodily life is not forfeited forever because the, the mystery of the resurrection of the dead is real. It has been inaugurated in Jesus Christ and is present mysteriously in our world. The Eucharistic experience there enters into it. There's something of that in the real presence. Worlds are meeting there. Dimensions are encountering. And so our faith tells us that we are body and soul and complete as such and therefore that there will be this eventual reuniting of body and soul. How? We don't quite know or understand. But the Feast of the Assumption reminds us of that truth. In her case, a Blessed Lady, there weren't any consequences of original sin because the original sin was not there. When one thinks of the way that many people go through life with great effort to preening the body, making sure the body is as beautiful as possible, and basing their success on the beauty thereof, one sees that quite often there's a lack of complete vision. The body, when the soul is beautiful, participates already in that beauty. A face which is attached to a person who is in the state of joy and inner peace and grace will be more peaceful 
and there will be a beauty there which is not in the haggard look of a person who is causing pain to others all the time and is therefore suffering itself. We are psychosomatic beings. One can read a soul in the eyes to some extent. They are the windows of the soul. And there the soul comes to the surface and two fields encounter each other, the visible and the invisible. To get back to the mystery of being born and being grateful for being born, it's something that one should be aware of when one still has youth and time. Because when one is at a grave, one sees that for the person therein there is no more time. And already in the years preceding that, the last stage of life, there is no more time to have a new orientation. Time is running out, and the young person doesn't realize that, or take sufficient care with regard to the orientation thereof. Try this, try that, without seeing the consequences. I remember years ago meditating on one verse with regard to that. It was what comes in the teaching of James in his epistle. It's chapter 4 and verse 14. I had it here in German. Er wits nicht, was morgen sein wird. You know not what tomorrow will be. That is a profound truth. And in anticipating tomorrow, we miss the one certainty that we have, the now of reality. Hic et nunc, the grace of the present. To be precise, of the present moment. That is the point where eternity and time intersect. Nowhere else, ever. I wrote these quietly, trying to be aware that the beginning of a new year it was the 10th of January 1999, getting towards the end of the millennium actually. Time was to be appreciated for what it was. For who knows, tomorrow may be very sad. The grace of the now needs to be enjoyed and rested upon in all its rich fullness. There is no knowing what the morrow brings upon the wings of dawn. There is no hour that knows another's shape. And little things today upon tomorrow wield much power. For though a dream be bright upon the night that broods on days to come, its light, when seen, may yet be doubly wan. For man's full might is might that might have been and not have been. O oh, morrow, burn yet brightly in the sky of hope that spins the earth. For mirth is yet in but a sparkle held. And 
rhythms high. Move in youth's early dance. Air, sunlight set upon a day or two. Too quickly burnt for fairer is the morn than eves a learn